Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Learning Sparks. My name is Richard Hazler. I'm the proud principal of the Quantic Valley Middle School in Pompton Plains, New Jersey. We're a grade six through eight middle school, part of the Quantic Township School District, and we are very excited today. This is a special episode of Learning Sparks. We'd like to talk about instructional strategies that enhance student achievement in the classroom. And I'm honored to have our guest today, Weston Kishnick, author of Bold School. He's here today at our Paquanic Technology Summit. And I thought it'd be a great opportunity to talk a little bit about blended learning and the impact that that has on students in the classroom. So Wes, thanks for being here. Awesome, Rich. Uh, I'm happy to be here, man. Thank really, you. Really appreciate it. Wes rocked the keynote this morning and has been working with our staff today. And so I thought, just the first question I thought I'd ask you is tell us a little bit about how you came up with your book, Bold School, uh, maybe a little bit about yourself, and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, a absolutely. So uh, just a quick bit about myself. Like I, I am a teacher at heart. I, I, I love teaching. It's how I began all my keynotes with you know, I just, it, all people need to know about me is that I, I have the heart of the teacher. I love teaching. And so uh, the genesis for writing Bold School was just really simple. So Bold School is just a mashup of the words blended and old, because uh, when I started to look at blended learning, both from uh, my side as a, as a practitioner at the time, and then through uh, the leadership perspective, and then just through the, the, the lens of a learner, uh, what I started to notice is that uh, this this view of blended learning was starting to develop that that blended learning is just exclusively you know station rotation or flip learning or flex models and I was just like man there's uh, it, those those models are great they're wonderful but I was concerned because there just didn't seem to be much room for that traditional practice that we know works with kids mm -hmm. uh, not that that we love just because like oh it's something we've always done and we love it and we don't want to deviate but we love it because we know it works with kids and. Uh, you know, I tell the story of uh, the uh, the guy I did the, my student teaching with, who was uh, an absolute master teacher, Kirk Datto, and I'm just I think about him all the time, and I thought about him a lot as I was writing the book um, because I worried that in in the pursuit of innovation, we would have pushed out really great teachers like him, really great, you know quote unquote, old school teachers who have these great methodologies and do these amazing things that work with children. Right. And so I wanted to say like, hey, if you are the direct instruction master of the universe, or if you are the Socratic seminar master of the universe, or if you love concept mapping, like where do opportunities for blended learning live in those spaces? And, and the answer is, they do live there. There are abundant opportunities to still, you know, hold on to those practices that we know work and blend with purpose in a way that works for both kids and for teachers. because. I mean, the, the number one fear that a lot of teachers have around blended learning is that the arrival of technology represents the departure of everything they love about teaching and learning. And I just, I didn't want that to be the case. I didn't want teachers to feel like their practice was broken, like they were broken. They are the number one thing, thing that has always worked about teaching uh, and, and they still work. And we have to make sure that great tools serve great teachers, not that we arrive at this place where great teachers are supporting these great tools. One of the things you said today, you know, I got a round of applause from our staff, is that education is not broken. No. And, and that there is a place for every kind of teacher. You know, it, we talked a little bit earlier about the difference that we're seeing now in new teachers and, and what we see in veteran staff. So, you know, what advice would you give to a, to a veteran teacher now who has all this technology and, you know, is, is getting thrown a million different gadgets and apps and all these things? What advice would you give to a veteran teacher today? Yeah, so I, I think every veteran teacher out there, every teacher in general, should be able to identify like, what is the thing you're awesome at, mm -hmm. right? What is the thing that you are great at? Uh, because when I when I do professional development or I do instructional coaching with teachers, like I, I'm, I'm a huge advocate of coaching to strengths. It's the thing that we do in every other coaching field, right? Like, uh, so I, I told you earlier, like I still coach high school football, I love it. We've got this kid right now who's, you know, 5'8", five, 5'9", five, runs a legit 4'4", 4, 4'5", 4, 4, 40, he is super fast. Right. I'm not gonna take that kid and make him an offensive lineman. It doesn't, I'm just, I'm, it doesn't make sense, it right. doesn't suit his skill set. I'm gonna take him and put him in a position to be successful based on where his skills live. And the same should be true for teachers. So for a veteran teacher, I would say, what is the thing you're awesome at? Like, uh, again, do you love interactive video? Right? Do you, uh, you know, do you love close reading? Like, figure out the thing that you are awesome at, that you are great at, and figure out ways that you can use technology to make you more effective and more efficient at that thing. Mm -hmm. Grow your strength, grow your, grow your blended competency in the place where you are already strong pedagogically, and then figure out places where you can grow as a pedagogue while adding technology to grow those competencies as well. Like that's that's how we grow overall proficiency, not just like. All right, let me throw a dart at a strategy and throw a dart at a tool and figure out how to mash these together. And now I have to learn both at the same time. Yeah. No, I, we did a book study with my staff la, uh, last year, 
And one of the things they latched onto was the lecture piece, you know, because yeah. they're, they're being told now that lecture is not a great strategy to use. You got to have students engaged in learning. It can't just be all about you. But uh, what I liked about in your book is that you talked about how lecture is such a powerful tool when used effectively in the classroom. So if you could just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. lecture. Lecture is a super powerful tool. And and lecture as a part of direct instruction. And we got to be careful not to use those interchangeably, right? So direct instruction includes lecturing and feedback and questioning. Like all of those things are part of direct instruction. But lecturing is not is not bad. Right. Uh, but but as educators, we have to come to consensus like. Uh, lecturing and direct instruction didn't get a bad reputation because it's a bad strategy. It got a bad reputation when it became our only strategy. And that's on us. Yep. That's on us. That's where we have to grow as educators. But that doesn't mean we throw the baby out with the bathwater and we just say like, oh, you know, direct instruction, that. No. If we look at John Hattie's work, direct instruction has an effect size of around six tenths, which means kid, kids can potentially grow a year and a half over a single academic year's worth of time. Direct instruction needs to still be a part of what we do and what happens in our classroom. It works, it's effective. Our challenge is how do we support a strategy like direct instruction once we've identified that it works with a, a, a digital tool like Kahoot, right? Let's not play Kahoot for Kahoot's sake, sure. right? Let's not do a poll everywhere for poll everywhere's sake. Let's not use Mentimeter for poll everywhere's sake, but how can we integrate these tools into a moment of direct instruction so that they can provide us feedback and we can provide direct instruction uh, in, in chunks where we're teaching kids uh, based on the feedback they give us in the moment, we're providing direct instructions of, uh, relative to places where they have gaps and relative to places where they're telling us they already know this, we can shorten our direct instruction and move on to the next thing. All right, that's so huge because you're talking about a lot of things there. You're talking about engagement, you're talking about feedback, you're talking about analyzing students' growth, their gaps, where they may need to be. When you're talking about you know learning sparks in the classroom, getting kids engaged in what they're doing, it is our responsibility to find those issues where students may be weak and capitalize on them. And that's where the tools can become very effective. Yeah, you can use those tools in such a way where doing all of those things doesn't have to be a nightmare for mm -hmm. the teacher. Because when you're talking about creating learning sparks in the classroom, like, like sparks come from fire, right? And you cannot have a fire in your belly about teaching if you're so concerned that creating all of these teaching and learning moments are just going to absolutely grind you down to the nub mm -hmm. and then you're going to have no energy and or enthusiasm to implement any of these like right. it's it's again one of the reasons why i wrote bold schools because i wanted to create blended learning scenarios that work both for kids and for teachers and the fact of the matter is you know for better or for worse like they, it has to work for for all stakeholders sure. in order for it to continue because there's not a single initiative that i know of not one that can thrive in a culture of negativity and if we don't have positive attitudes around blend, around blended learning and the fact that it can make us more effective and more efficient at, at the great work that we do for kids, then it's not going to be something that takes hold and has a lasting impact. Well, let's talk about that effectiveness because one of the things you talked about in the keynote, and I won't steal what you did in the keynote, you got to get West to yeah. come and give a keynote, <laughs> but you talk about your, your strategic blended framework and what, yes. what makes that up. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about what that is and how that leads to effective instruction and effective learning in the classroom. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I talked uh, I talked in the keynote, and, and every every time I come speak about that bold school methodology, um, you know, there's a lot of excitement about what's going on in the ed tech space right now, and justifiably so. There's so much to get excited about, but the fact of the matter is that excitement can lead us to poor decision making. And so what happens is we'll stumble across a tool like Nearpod or GimKit, and it's like, these things are amazing. But then the next question that comes into our brain is like, oh man, Nearpod is awesome. What am I going to do with Nearpod tomorrow? Right. Danger, danger, danger. Not a good thing. No, because right in that moment, the focus becomes the tech tool. And we have to be about rigorous and relevant learning outcomes for kids. Like We have to be about high, high effect size instructional strategies. To, so the kids can meet those outcomes. And the minute we start asking questions like, oh, what am I going to do with Flipgrid tomorrow? Kids lose. Sure. Kids lose because the focus becomes the tool. So in those moments, we have to be able to step back and say, no, 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 not what am I going to do with Flipgrid tomorrow? What's my rigorous and relevant learning outcome that I want to, that I want to accomplish here? What highly effective strategy am I going to leverage so that kids can meet that learning outcome? And then the question becomes, can Flipgrid, or whatever the tech tool is, support that instructional strategy so the kids can meet that learning outcome? And can Flipgrid support that instructional strategy to make the strategy more effective and efficient than it's ever been before? And if the answer is yes, then we plan, because we know what gets planned gets done, and we assess for rigor relevance. Have we, have, is what we've designed even any good? Are students working to a place where they work and think?
Now, you're a senior fellow for the International Center for Leadership and Education, right? Yes. Um, so then you talk about the, the rigor relevance framework, and that free framework goes from teachers doing to students working. Yes. You know, and, and so moving from that A quadrant to D quadrant, that's that's a large gap. You know, yeah. And for a, for a new teacher, that's a hard thing to do, to get to, because you, you it's hard to give up control of the classroom. Absolutely. So from an administrator standpoint, what, what is, a coaching advice do you have to help new teachers as they as they embark on this journey yeah. of teaching? You know, to, to have these strategies be focused on the outcomes first, yes. right? But then incorporate this technology. Considering you know we're a one to one school, I know a lot of schools are moving to you know getting technology in the hands of kids, and that that they think that that's going to solve world problems, but we know that it doesn't. Yeah. You know, and so it comes from you know how, what advice do we give to new new teachers to help help use technology powerfully? Yeah. So it, you talked about the rigor relevance framework and. And for a new teacher looking at the rigor relevance framework, again, so think of it, I, I like to break it down and think of it really simply, right? So quad A is the teacher does all the work. The quad B is the student does all the work. Uh, quad C is the student thinks. And then quad D is the students work and think. And we have to get kids working towards quad B, right? When we're talking about using digital tools, we have to ask ourselves, are kids using these digital tools, right? And, uh, and is the teacher asking them to use it in a way that aligns with uh, with proven pedagogy so that they can meet rigorous and relevant learning outcomes? Mm -hmm. And in their use of those tools, are they using it to work and think, work and think? And that can be daunting, like you said, it can be really daunting for a new teacher. So what we have to uh, make sure our new teachers know, and all teachers know for that matter, is there, Quad D is a place you visit, not a place that you live, right? right? And it's so critical to understand, like, the, the expectation isn't that we move every moment of every lesson, every time, all the way up to Quad D where kids are working and thinking and applying this new knowledge and new skills to real world unpredictable scenarios. If you try to do that all day, every day, A, you will fail and B, you will quit because you'll feel like a failure all the time. Quad D is a place you visit, not a place that you live. Now, asterisk, Quad D is not a place that you visit on the family vacation once a year. Right? There's there's a happy middle ground there where it's not a place where you visit almost never. It's not a place you're going to live every day. Like you're going to venture in and out of Quad D moment to moment throughout the course of a lesson. And I think once teachers start to understand that about the rigor relevance framework, it kind of uh, uh, alleviates the, the stress and anxiety that comes with it. And correct me if I'm wrong, in that, in that C and D area, that's where you can really build in the grit and the growth mindset with kids, you know, and teach them that failure is okay. Absolutely. You know, that they can get after it. It may not work the first time. It may not work the second time, but it may work the third or fourth time. A absolutely. And that perseverance and, and reflection that we want the students doing when they learn. That, that's absolutely true. There's value in each of those quadrants. Yep. There's a, I mean, there's going to have to be time, whereas the teachers, we're living in quad A, mm -hmm. where as the teacher, I got to do some work. I got to do some of the heavy lifting because I possess a skill set or a content knowledge that my kids don't have, and I need to give it to them. And the only way for me to do that is to put in some work. So yeah, absolutely. We're stressing and understanding that there's value in each one of those quadrants, and it's not like you know quads A, B, and C uh, are four-letter words. They're not. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I loved about your book is how you use data. You know, and data is a, a scary word for, for sure. educators in general, but, you know, you use John Hattie's work for a lot of your book. I love John Hattie's you know, Visible yeah. learning is, is fantastic. So what, when, when you were talking about that and thinking about it as you wrote your book and you, you looked at different strategies, what was a teaching strategy that really stood out to you? Aside from the direct instruction that you talked about, what was one that you really said, wow, I, I never realized the impact that this really had on student learning. And maybe, you know, that, that um, effect size is very high. Yeah, so a couple of things there. I love John Hattie's work. I'm a huge John Hattie fan. He was nice enough to come out and endorse the book, which I was uh, over the moon about. And you talk about data, right? And I, I always refer back to that Doug Reeves quote, you know, we're drowning in data and starved for information. Yep. And when you take a look at John Hattie's work sometimes, it, it's easy to feel that way. Sure. Because he's got so much data and it's easy to drown in it. And so what I wanted to do with John Hattie's work was really identify like, okay, he's got like 256 influences about what works and doesn't in education. And so I wanted to take a look and say, okay, from a practitioner's perspective, like what are the 10 or 11 most frequently used high yield strategies that teachers are using? Are using? And you know, you asked me which, which one of the ones I love so much. Uh, I love reciprocal teaching. I love reciprocal teaching for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, I think it's often misunderstood. Uh, a lot of teachers will, will tell me that reciprocal teaching is a strategy where students teach other students. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not, that's, that's peer tutoring, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I love reciprocal teaching. It's a close reading strategy. 
that it, it, it can be used any anytime kids read anything, any grade level, any content area, which is what I love about reciprocal teaching. And so it, it's a simple four step methodology where, and whereby anytime students read anything, they predict, they clarify, they question, and they summarize. They make predictions about what they're gonna read. They clarify important vocabulary before they read the text. Right? They ask questions about the text, not the teacher, but they ask questions about the text, and then they provide they're provided opportunities to summarize. I love that methodology. It's a methodology that I've been using with my own children since they were babies. Right? Anytime my kids would read a story, uh, we do story time at night. We uh, do a quick picture walk, flip, 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 make a prediction. Right? We go through. I point at sight words. They read their sight words, and then I point at a word that wasn't a sight word. And I'd say, hey, read this word for me. Do you know what it means? And if they didn't, we'd hop on my phone and we'd look for a picture that represents that word. So awesome. we'd go through, read the book, and I would ask them, hey, you know, Everett, Charlotte, like, what's one question you would ask the author of this book? Or what's one question you would ask the main character of this book? Right? And then last but not least, I would have them retell or give me a summary of the book. And it's a thing I've been doing with my own children, like I said, since they were babies. And they've been reading a grade level or two above uh, their proficiency level uh, since they entered school. And that has nothing to do with me, and don't tell her I said it, nothing to do with his mother, right? right? It has everything to do with the application of an, a highly effective strategy over time. And, uh, what You talked about that in, in one of your workshops today, and one of the teachers walked out and they said, wow, you know, I never looked at reciprocal teaching that way, the way you just described it, and, and the impact that it can make on kids. And, and you know, so the takeaways from what you've done today with our staff you know, can, is, is going to make lasting impacts in the classroom. And, and that's that's a testament to you and, and to your message. But, um, you know, we're in, in closing, we're going to finish up, you know, it, the Quantic Summit, Tech Summit today, we had a series of workshops focused on, on ed technology. And one of the things that Wes really talked about is that it's not about the technology, it's about the outcomes and the strategies, you know, and, and then putting the plan in place. So, you know, what, what's the last piece of advice that you have for, for us here at the district or just teachers in general about the effective use of blended learning? Yeah, let's, let's just get all, let's all get on the same page. Let's all get on the same page, and I'll, I'll say one of the things that I say uh, in my keynote, we, we have to come to an agreement that in the space of blended learning, learning is king, and growth is queen, and cool is the court jester. And the jester is technology, and the jester has value, but don't put him in charge of the kingdom. Well, I want to thank Wes. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for being at the, at the Tech you, Summit. Um, Wes does a bold school chat every other Sunday night on Twitter. I uh, highly recommend that you hop on there and, and talk about student learning. We talk about a variety of different strategies. Uh, last week we talked about RTI, I think was one of, the, uh, one of our topics. Yep. And uh, you know, Wes is truly just a gifted educator. I uh, highly recommend that you bring him to, to your schools and uh, do some PD for your staff. But Wes, thanks again for being here. You can Thank follow you, him on, uh, I think it's Wes underscore Kishnick. Is there it? you go. Wes underscore Kishnick on Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter, Average Hazler. And uh, thanks again for joining us on this episode of Learning Sparks. And as I say at the end of every episode, always do what's best for kids. Have a great day, everybody.